So I'm going to talk this morning about why beauty matters. Why does it matter? It matters because it matters to individuals, to real women and increasingly men as they navigate their lives. It matters because people think it makes their lives go better or worse. It matters because it's something that very many of us spend time and money striving for. It matters because the extent of the industries and infrastructure which are required to support the pursuit of the body beautiful is vast. From food to fashion, from basic grooming to body modification. You'll be amazed, I know I was, at the extent to which beauty matters when you start looking at it from the perspective of justice and through the lens of global ethics. So today, in my very short paper, I will only be able to touch on some of the ethical and justice issues which arise in the context of beauty. And I'm going to focus on those which I hope will resonate with other papers being presented over the course of today and tomorrow, in the hope that we can draw some shared concerns from the very disparate topics. Beauty concerns which speak to the global gender justice debate include the commodification of women's bodies, gender subordination and the need to pay attention to how structural gender injustice is manifested and replicated, the connections between individual choices and communal goods, and importantly, the burning question of how can we change things. So today I'm going to talk about what, why beauty matters, about the contemporary ideal of beauty, my work on the topic, why beauty should matter to philosophy, why it matters ethically, why it matters more as it applies to more people for longer and as the demands of beauty increase and normal is ever harder to attain. And I'll finish by drawing attention to the opportunity costs of beauty. So why it should matter for global justice, even if you don't buy anything else that I say. So let me begin by saying a little about what I mean by beauty. The book I'm currently writing, Perfect Me, in that I explore the current dominant beauty ideal as a moral philosopher and, unsurprisingly, one with a particular interest in global justice. The definition I take of the dominant beauty ideal is a very broad one and it goes something like this. Thin and or slim, definitely not fat. Smooth and hairless, and hairless is becoming ever more important. Golden skinned, which usually means tanned white skinned and lightened black skin. Firm, remember strong is the new sexy. So my students tell me that buff is the word that I need to embrace here. So big backsides are good, but only below a skinny waist. And this is a growing trend. So the American Society for Plastic Surgeons reported 25,737 operations in the US in 2014. And perhaps most important is the cult of youth. <clears throat> to be beautiful, you must look young. Not saggy, not wrinkly, and not full of gravitas. So Perfect Me, my book title, can be applied to this ideal in three ways, at least. First, as an individual's aspiration to perfect themselves. I want to be perfect. Second, as an assertion of what being perfect is. This is what I would be if I were perfect. And third, as a command, as something which requires obedience. So, perfect me, a demand upon me which I should deliver. So I make three arguments in the book, three main arguments. First, about the ubiquity and dominance of the ideal, which I claim is different to past ideals. In terms of dominance, it applies to more types of women and increasingly men, it applies for longer and it is global. In addition, and importantly, it requires technological involvement to attain. The big booty with the small waist or the large breasts over visible ribs require technological help for most people. Likewise, technological fixes are required to maintain plump lips and smooth, unpigmented skin as we age. Taken together, this makes the ideal harder to attain, as well as harder to resist and reject. My second argument addresses what this beauty ideal implies for understandings of the self, for what human beings are. 
And key to my position is an argument about the imagined self and the power of the imagined self. A self which has the power to shape, constrain and limit our supposed choices. And finally, from the first two arguments, I make a third claim about why choice and consent arguments don't and can't provide ethical safeguards in this context. So this is by way of context. Of these three arguments that I make, today only the first will get much airtime as I talk about why beauty matters. So first then, why beauty? Those of you who know my previous work in global ethics, health, bioethics, women rights and feminist theory might think this is a bit of a departure. Worse, you might even wonder why I'm turning from serious issues of blatant harm, exploitation and injustice to something as unimportant and trivial as beauty. I aim to convince you otherwise. Beauty is not trivial or fluff, rather it raises serious and important ethics and justice issues. The assumption that beauty is <coughs> unimportant is pernicious but revealing. It is a direct consequence of the ingrained structural issues of patriarchy, injustices which we carry directly into the academia. Consider the omission of debates about beauty and body image from global ethics literature and the canon of moral philosophy more generally. Beauty is not an issue which global ethicists and those who work in global justice standardly consider as a core concern. And here I am just as guilty as everyone else. The philosophical canon is clearly defined and those of us who work in feminist theory also work in the mainstream of our disciplines. We want to be taken seriously as philosophers. And sadly, feminist philosophy is still feminist philosophy. It is not just philosophy. In moral philosophy and ethics, just as in society more broadly, women's issues are regarded as minority issues. This is part of what I mean by the workings of patriarchy. Women are not a minority. A truism and a boring truism but it is beyond frustrating to realise just how little has changed in the last three decades. Women's issues should not be minority issues in the political landscape, and they should not be minority topics in philosophy, and yet they still are. And, and another truism, women are just as guilty of treating topics in this way as men are. So beauty becomes a side issue done by feminist philosophers when we're working in this area, rather than a real and serious topic for philosophy. Serious philosophy is done by the boys, and by us when we copy the boys. This is the way that patriarchy works. It makes what is in fact structural bias, which supports the power of the status quo, look normal, natural and legitimate. These are the messages of second wave feminism, lessons that too often we have forgotten. If I reflect on my own academic journey, I can see just how easily I absorbed these hierarchies. A few weeks ago, Shami Chakrabarti gave a public lecture here and described her own trajectory. Her views of gender justice and practical mechanisms for change, such as affirmative action and positive discrimination. As a young woman, she was against these policies, but over time, she has reversed her view and now is a proponent. Just as I, as a young scholar, wanted no special treatment, I was just as good as my male peers, thank you very much. But I have not yet realised the power of structural injustice and that special treatment was already built into the system and not in my favour. I believed that academia was a meritocracy. I know now that this is not the case. And the work of the Women in Philosophy movement has done much to make the philosophical community realise this and try and <coughs> act on it. The philosophical community is structurally and communally biased, despite the goodwill and intentions of many, if not most, of the individuals within it. Like so much, this is not an individual issue, and nor is it addressed simply by individuals trying harder. Here things are beginning to happen, but addressing gender injustice requires more than helping more women to do more philosophy. It also requires we think more about how philosophy is done and what topics philosophers consider, and this returns us to beauty. 
From some points of view, it is very odd that moral philosophers have given beauty in the form of the contemporary beauty ideals so little attention. After all, the concept of beauty has traditionally exercised philosophers, and the physical beauty of the body has been important too, even if the body has often been a cipher for something else. Think, for instance, of Athenian youths, or women representing the virtues. And perhaps the renewed and growing, growing interest in the philosophy of love and the philosophy of sex is a signal that things might be changing here. Moreover, beauty has not been wholly ignored, and there are some truly inspirational philosophers working in this area. I'll mention just some of my favourites. Sandra Bartke, Susan Bordeaux, Claire Chambers and Iris Marion Young. And these are two of my favourite books. One quite old, one much newer. If you haven't read them, put them on your Christmas list. But the bias remains. And given the importance of beauty and appearance for women, who, may I remind you, are not a minority, and the costs of beauty, individually and communally, it is hard to explain why beauty is not a topic, a mainstream topic in global justice, unless one invokes the workings of patriarchy and the trivialising of women's issues. What philosophers like Susan Bordeaux and Claire Chambers do is emphasise the social and cultural context which constrain and influence the choices that people make, and part of that context is patriarchy. Failure to take account of context and to imagine that issues are individual feeds the myth that injustice isn't structural, that individuals can succeed if they just make the right choices and gain the necessary expertise. That was the view of the younger me. But as soon as you look communally, such claims are obviously flawed. The fact that 24% of permanent jobs in philosophy departments are held by women is not because men are four times better at philosophy than women. And the fact that beauty is not considered is not because it is trivial. It is for other reasons. Reasons which taken together diminish some groups and the concerns of some groups and promote, in all senses of promote, other people and their concerns. So not only has beauty been wrongly trivialised as a minority issue, this ideal has also been neglected as an ethical issue. A cursory glance at the language which surrounds beauty practices shows that this debate is profoundly morally coloured, literally saturated with value. And more than this, the language of beauty promotes the ideal. It suggests that this is a good way to live, a worthwhile ideal to aspire to. It offers the promise of flourishing, happiness and success. Consider beauty talk. Be your best self, the best you can be. It's still you, but the best version of you, the real you. Such terms invoke the ideal, the imagined perfect you waiting to be revealed or attained, if only you learn the proper skills, engage in the proper practices and buy the right products. These are comparative terms about how you can be better, and likewise, moral words like should, ought or worth proliferate. You're worth it, you owe it to yourself, and conversely, you let yourself go, and presumably, you're not worth it. Take a few common tropes, Tropes. I'm learning new words as I engage in cultural theory. Tropes. Okay. Common assumptions and narratives that succeeding in beauty equates to life going well and promises that it will deliver the goods of the good life. First, the more beautiful you are, the better job you will get. So advice such as look the part or dress for the job you want, not the one you have, is common. I was actually given this advice, which in my case was particularly bad advice as there was no way that I was going to emulate the dress of, at the time, the almost exclusively male, and forgive me, badly dressed professorate. <laughs> Second, much advertising plays on the assumption that attaining the beauty ideal will pay off. So these assumptions are constantly reinforced. Things like, if I'm thinner, prettier, sexier, he'll love me more, I'll be more successful, I'll be happier. If only I looked after myself better, this wouldn't have happened. This is back to the letting yourself go trope, the implication that how thin, young and beautiful you are 
is primary in determining the extent to which you should be loved or should, should succeed. Again, the working of patriarchy is deeply ingrained and presented as the natural order. Even though the heteronormative assumptions and the model of femininity which underpin these assumptions is extremely limited and constricting. But it is everywhere and usually unquestioned. That this ideal matters is borne out by what people think and the choices they make, although I'm sceptical that these are choices in any real sense. Studies show that the majority of women report that they often or always think about their body and make decisions on diet and exercise based on looks, not on health. And I'll be providing more data as we go on. So it is against this ideal of thinness, youth and firmness that individuals construct their identities and judge themselves. The ideal provides shared social standards, norms and punishes deviation. This is true externally and internally. Externally, non-conformity with the ideal results in lower employment prospects and in reduced opportunities. And evidence does suggest that good looks result in more interviews and higher salaries. Just to use one example, in one study, attractive women had a callback rate of 54% for, for women and 47% for men versus 7% for women and 26% for men who were in the unattractive category. Internally, women punish and beat up on themselves. They feel they are failing, they are unhappy with how they look, and often by this they mean with themselves. And what self means in this context is something I take time over in the book. The beauty ideal, then, I claim is a value framework against which one judges oneself and others and deem oneself and others good and bad. For some, the ideal of being perfect is all-encompassing. Whereas for others, it is less invasive, balanced by other ideals and goods, and some even manage to reject it. But without a doubt, many people feel happy and proud and deem themselves successful when they attain some aspect of this ideal, when they've reached their goal weight, filled their wrinkles or firmed their thighs. And like other dominant ideals, the goal of perfection remains something beyond, something that people keep striving for. Obviously, the beauty ideal is self-defeating over time. We all sag, we all wrinkle, and we all die. But this does not necessarily diminish the power of the ideal. Indeed, that perfection is impossible is key to ensuring meaning over time, just as it is for other ideals, such as striving for goodness. Beauty, then, is an ethical ideal, and one which I argue is more dominant than past ideals making it of interest not only to moral philosophers thinking about the good life, but to those of us who work in global ethics and justice. Very few of us are immune to beauty norms. How many people really only groom for health and hygiene reasons and only own the clothes that they need to cover their bodies and protect from the elements? It is the norm to comply to beauty standards and compliance is policed. Most women engage in hairstyling, <coughs> increasingly in colouring, and in some hair removal in at least some circumstances. And what is normal is becoming <coughs> ever more demanding, and it is likely to become more so. Currently, half of girls and women aged 16 to 21 would consider plastic surgery, and this figure will likely rise as surgery and other technical fixes are further normalised. I argue compliance to the beauty regime is now expected of all women to some extent, irrespective of other factors, in contrast to previous ideals which applied to only certain types of women. Think about how women are judged in the public sphere, in areas where being beautiful is not material to their performance. For instance, the coverage of sportswomen or politicians. Media coverage invariably comments on how they look, irrespective of why they are in the public eye. There are at least as many inches about Hillary Clinton's dress sense and hairstyle as they are about anything she ever did or said. And currently about how she's doing for her age. Being 67 seems much more problematic for a woman who wants to be president than for a man. Whether or not women in the public eye engage, they will be judged and inevitably they end up engaging and this is true for all of us, increasingly in our home and work lives. 
Appearance is commented on by students as they rate their professors. And Fashion at the School Gate is a daily newspaper and magazine feature, making drop-off and pick-up of children a point of fashion judgment. And the means and methods of this type of judgment now grow with the opportunities of social media. Women and girls, and with girls it can be particularly devastating, are judged and liked according to how they look. And the online profiles we create and the selfies we post are a way to package and present ourselves to the world. And let me tell you, taking a good selfie is another form of beauty expertise which has to be mastered, and there's many column inches on that too. <coughs> In addition, the ideal is demanding over a longer period. It begins as young as three, and this alone should make you doubt claims that these are just matters of choice. Let me give you some figures. Nearly half of girls aged three to six are anxious about how they look, and a third would like to change their weight, hair colour, or another aspect of their physical appearance. In a different study, this study... Girls aged three to five exhibited strong preferences for thinness expressed in terms of who they want as playmates and best friends. And more, they attach qualities to these silhouettes. Some are positive, nice, smart, has friends, neat, cute and quiet. Note, quiet, the researchers and the girls all assume that quiet is a positive quality. The negative adjectives are mean, stupid, has no friends, sloppy, ugly and loud. And I'm sure you can guess which qualities attached to which silhouettes. If I fail to convince you earlier that this stuff is fundamentally ethical, you might want to rethink. Another large-scale UK study shows that one in five girls of primary school, aged 7 to 11, have been on a diet, and this rises to over half in secondary schools. And perhaps more significantly for the claim that beauty matters, these girls believe that how they look is important, with 87% of 11 to 21 year olds saying that women are judged more on their appearance than their ability. So that's nearly 90% of girls and young women who believe that how they look will matter more than anything they can or will do and say. Given this, it's not surprising that 71% of them want to lose weight. And before anyone thinks that these are scarce statistics of the type that might be unscrupulously used to create a good headline, or provide a soundbite, please note I took these from that radical pressure group, the Girl Guides. Statistics are not my stock in trade, I am a philosopher, and of course they can be misused. But here if you look at the studies, of which there are very, very many, the message is continually the same. Appearance matters, and moreover, girls and women are not wrong to make these judgments and to think that beauty matters. It has been shown time and time again that those who are less attractive are less likely to be viewed as smart, happy, interesting, likeable, successful and well-adjusted. And there I quote. Consequently, these are not adaptive preferences or false consciousness, something we'll talk more about tomorrow. Our expectations are high, and apparently in part because so rarely do we see non-enhanced bodies. This is a breast-checking campaign featuring real breasts. To quote Bodo, talking about those who choose breast implants, she states, These women take the risk not because they have been passively taken in by media norms of the beautiful breast, almost always silicon-enhanced, but because they have correctly discerned that these norms shape the perceptions and desires of potential lovers and employers. They are neither dupes nor critics of sexist culture. Rather, their overriding concern is their right to be desired, loved and successful on its terms. These are understandable, you might even say rational choices, in the current climate. And they become more so the more normal such practices are. If such trends continue, then what is normal will require more, and it will become ever harder not to choose to conform and undergo the necessary procedures. How women look does affect how they are judged. Girls are more likely to be able to form relationships if they don't fall outside that ideal silhouette. And as they get older, be invited to interviews and get jobs. This does not, of course, mean that other things don't matter too. They won't get that job interview if they don't have the grade. 
But the point is that whatever else they have or don't have, they are right to think that they will be judged on how they look. And it takes a very unusual individual in a particular and unusual context to ignore the pressures and demands of beauty. As well as starting earlier, the pressures of the ideal continue later. 30 is the new 20, 50 the new 40, and at 60 you're supposed to be reclaiming the joys of your 30s. After all, you're child-free again. And at 50, a bikini body is still possible. Just look at Helen Mirren and she's 69. And it's not just celebrities who are expected to chase this. We all are. To quote, my 56-year-old forehead will now be judged against my neighbours, not just goldies and shares. Studies support this. In a recent survey of women over 50, only 12% reported being happy with their body size, with 77% saying that shape played a primary role in their self-evaluation. Here technology is crucial, and analogies with Repotech are pertinent. Pressures which used to end or at least relax with the menopause now continue. Just as you can choose to delay childbearing, and your employer might even freeze your eggs to give you this choice, so you can choose to maintain your youth and looks, and you might even feel duty-bound to do so. My final point on the expansion of the idea, ideal is that it increasingly applies globally. One common response to discussions of beauty is, this is just a matter of taste, taste differs over time and place. From this, two arguments are made. First, because they change, beauty norms can't be overly dominant and demanding. And second, because these are mere fashions, they're not worth serious attention. Sound familiar? But while of course there are variations in beauty norms, I argue that this is a weaker and weaker argument by which to challenge the dominance of the current beauty ideal. For while there are differences, the trend towards the mean and the emergence of a global norm is discernible. If I am right, then the current ideal is a homogenising one, which increasingly promotes a single global notion of beauty. If you look at changes over the last 30 years in Asian and African beauty queens, actors, singers and public figures, you will see a very obvious move, move towards a preference for thinness and light skin and other features of the ideal. To quote, no racial or ethnic group is invulnerable. Body insecurity can be exported, imported and marketed across the globe, just like any other profitable commodity. And that, I think, is what has happened. Let's look at the features of the ideal again. The thin trend is global. For instance, African men now find attractive younger, thinner women with lighter, yellower skin colour and a more homogenous skin tone. Smooth and hairless? Without a doubt, that's global. Golden skinned, most definitely global and harmful. Tanning and tanning booths have long documented serious consequences and skin lightening cream is often full of toxic chemicals including mercury and is considered a growing public health risk in parts of Africa, Asia and Latin America. Other issues, other issues where practices suggest a global norm is emerging are surgery trends, particularly for large eyes and cheekbones which in some cultures requires extensive surgery, with perhaps the most dramatic being the growth of the Asian eye lift. So, for instance, in Korea, between a fifth and a third of women have had cosmetic surgery, and some estimates are as high as half. And you might think that the rise in bum lifts and lip fillers is part of a trend towards a global norm. The homogenising tendency narrows what is acceptable <coughs> and enhances the dominance and the ubiquity of the ideal. And although this is controversial, the trend towards a relatively narrow global norm which requires surgery is evident. Not only is the ideal more dominant globally, but what it demands is more. And this is a matter of justice, as it profoundly shapes what is possible, what ways of life are available, and what opportunities we actually have. As the demands of beauty increase and the possibility of technological fixes grow, the pressures on individuals to choose to conform also grow. This is less choice, not more choice. I won't discuss my arguments about the failure of choice, that's the whole of the paper. But in short, we do not choose our beauty ideals as individuals. Arguably, we choose the extent to which we conform to them, but even this, I think, is questionable. Let me give you just one example from Claire Chambers in response to the claim that women are choosing this for themselves. 
Choosing to have breast implants, regardless of the desires of actual men, is not the same as choosing to have them immune from patriarchal norms. Practices are cultural. They do not submit to the meanings that an individual wants them to have for herself or for others. We can see this by considering the extreme oddity of a woman who did want to have breast implants in a society in which large breasts carried no meaning, one in which women were not objectified and sexualized in a way which large breasts were not considered more attractive by a society as a whole. Why on earth would anyone want to have surgery to insert heavy and dangerous alien objects into her body if there were no social meaning to or social payoff from the practice? A woman who did want to have breast implants in such a society would be like someone who wanted to have cosmetic knee implants in contemporary Britain. We need to be suspicious of creeping normalisation, just as we should of claims that these are unimportant and individual choices. Think how normal changes over time. Fairly recently, makeup was not permitted for respectable women, but today, makeup is the norm for most women. Hence, campaigns like the recent barefaced selfie. <coughs> these are fundraising campaigns precisely because it is no longer normal to see most women without makeup. Of course, there are some areas where women don't standardly wear makeup, but these are rarer, and studies report that often makeup increases perceptions of professionalism, and in many areas, not wearing makeup is just not an option. Hair dye is another instance where what is normal has changed dramatically in a very short time. And for many, dyeing one's hair is not seen as a beauty practice and augmentation, but just as basic grooming and maintenance. Maintenance being another very pernicious word. If we move from the hair on our head to the hair on our body, the changing norms are startling, and I think significant. Not least because of the influence of porn on our ideals of beauty and the infantilising of women, although that too is a topic for another day. But for whatever reason, it is now the norm to be increasingly hairless. In public, at the beach, at the pool, on a night out, most women think defluffing is routine, like washing or teeth cleaning. But hair removal is not for health reasons, and there are some serious health risks. So it's harder not to engage. What is required is more demanding in terms of time, money and pay. And indeed, in some lights, Routine practices, like continual body hair removal, might look more extreme in terms of costs and harms over a lifetime than invasive surgery does. As normal expands and the demands increase, gradually and with little debate, costly and harmful practices become routine and unremarkable. Literally unremarkable, not able to be remarked on. In these ways, then, beauty matters. It matters ethically as it functions as a dominant ideal according to which individuals judge themselves and are in turn judged. In justice terms, this should be enough for us to engage. And of course, there are other issues of justice which I haven't mentioned. If engaging in these practices does open doors in a parallel way to, say, education, then not having the means to engage is an inequality. Can we do it? As beauty becomes more important, then there are justice issues of discrimination for those who fall outside the norm. Here we can draw parallels with the disability rights literature. For instance, debates over whether selection for a hair lip is acceptable. And a recent study did find that 11% of couples would abort a fetus predisposed to obesity. There are also very many more issues about gender subordination and issues about the commodification and infantilising of women. There are also questions about visual culture, privacy and how to regulate all of this stuff. If you still think beauty doesn't matter, then let me finish in a more traditional way by looking at the cost of beauty as simply one sphere of economic activity and the opportunity cost of the beauty industries. In other words, what could we do with all this money and resource and time if we didn't do this? If you think that global poverty is the issue of global justice, then you might think you should engage in the beauty debate simply for issues of distributive justice. So, consider these statistics. Now, these are indicative only. Admittedly, I have no idea at all what I'm doing here, and I am seeking advice in the business school. So by the time I deliver my manuscript, 
I will have imposed some semblance of order. At the moment, I haven't. I have not anything to make a coherent claim. But I think there is a claim there. I think if I can get the stuff together and compare beauty, global beauty trade versus global arms trade or farmer trade, I think it might be well up there with it. So these are just a few stats that I have inadequately found on my own. So don't hold me to these. I suspect it's much bigger. Um, I don't need to read those out. Cosmetic toiletry and fragrance products, 123 billion, 2001. Hair removal growing really, really fast. That's the US market and the UK market is nearly the same. Surgery increasing 400, over 400% 400 since 1997. In one year, 10 million procedures, over $12 billion. And when you think about yourself, 4.5 days a year, the average UK woman, at a cost of £18,000 just on face products, so skincare and makeup, not hair, not time at the hairdresser, even the basic things. Okay, and um, it's also not an urban myth that in World War II, shipments of lip lipstick were prioritised over food shipments as necessary to morale. So, beauty matters. Even if you don't care about this trivial, fluffy, girly, minority issue that so shapes the lives of women and increasingly men, you should think that beauty matters for standard justice reasons of what we do with this world's scarce resources. And if you want to see what else I'm doing on beauty, you can check out the Beauty Demands website and project. Thank you very much.